trying to squeeze in Iowa, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, which are kind of fascinating political states in their own way. Uh, New Mexico, the only uh, majority minority state in the 50 US states, and Arizona, obviously, famous for the um, increasing uh, resistance of the immigrant population to the insane draconian policies there that are persecuting them. So we're going to go there and then in California right up to, uh, to, or to Washington, Seattle, Spokane. And then uh, with uh, the first Mormon candidate, we'd be remiss not to spend a day in Salt Lake. <laughs> also Moab on the way. Um, so we're, we're, getting, we're visiting Utah, certainly. And uh, and, uh, and you know, uh, the home state of uh, Todd Aiken, Missouri. So yes, you'll see uh, you know, Houston on the Pacific Estate. So it's, it's, it's now just occurring to me how crazy the tour is. Um, <laughs> but I'm very fortunate to have uh, the team at Democracy Now to, to work with while we're traveling, broadcasting from the road, and most importantly, uh, Tremendous uh, friend and colleague of mine who I'd like to introduce you to. Amy Newman. Uh,
your very own Rob Lorai on the first day, giving us a lay of the land here in Tampa, um, talking about the remarkable landmarks, the geography, the politics, and then we made our way to the convention floor and started to follow the money. That's our job. It is not there simply to broadcast the parties, either the Democratic or Republican parties or the parties that the parties engage in, but to get there behind the scenes. To be on the convention floor, yes, but to get into those corporate suites and to be out on the streets where the uninvited guests are, the thousands of people who also have something important to say. And how many of you heard Mike Burke, our senior producer on Democracy Now!, trying to question Sheldon Adelson on Wednesday? is the casino multi-billionaire magnate who says he will spend $100 million on these elections. He first was a supporter of Gingrich, has now moved over to Mitt Romney. Um, you know, after 2010, <coughs> the Citizens United decision, money already was flowing into politics, but this is that kind of I think corruption of the democratic process on steroids, unsourced money. Even if you feel that money should be equated with speech, as some do, we should know who's saying it. We should know where the money is coming from. And that is what's so frightening today. And so Mike and our videographer, Honey Masood, were patrolling the corporate suites and they saw Sheldon Addison in an entourage and went up to ask him about how much money he planned to spend in this election. And before Mike knew what happened, a woman who was right in front of him stepped back into him, throwing him off balance, and then she turned around, and Hami is more than six foot three, and she took his camera, went into the Adelson suite. Honey didn't even know what was happening, and he ran over to try to get his camera back, and she drops it on the floor. There's all security around them, and because they had no camera, and they were there to document, to ask questions, Mike pulled out his Android to begin to film, and they tried to take this away from him, and he's holding on to it, and he's saying, what is going on in here? that they are taking our property. And then one of the Adelson entourage came in and said, that's Adelson's daughter, and we're sorry, and we'll do anything to make this up to you. <laughs> Just out of the blue, and then she comes out and she apologizes. Um, this has gotten tremendous coverage because it is so difficult to get behind the scenes. Um, I was on the floor of the convention, attempting to interview David Koch. David and Charles Koch are the billionaire um, supporters of the Tea Party movement in this country, who are now promising to pour hundreds of millions of dollars, something like $400 million, into these elections. Um, their father, Fred Koch, is co-founder of the John Birch Society. Oh. And I think it's very interesting, you know, that was the, and is the racist organization, fiercely anti-civil rights. It's very interesting what has happened in the convergence of politics today. Because if you look at Mitt Romney's father, George Romney, he was gonna run against Goldwater for the Republican nomination for president in 1964. He went to the convention and he started to speak out for civil rights. You know, Goldwater had opposed the civil rights legislation. He said, we must be the party that supports equality. This is George Romney, Mitt Romney's father. And he particularly focused his force and his opposition to the John Birch Society. This was George Romney. And he spoke before the platform committee and he said, we must oppose extremism. Ultimately, he didn't win the nomination and he refused to support Barry Goldwater. He refused to support hate. And for that, he was vilified. And this was 
Mitt Romney's father. And now Mitt Romney, the son of George Romney, getting support from the Koch brothers, the sons of Fred Koch, the co-founders of the John, the co-founder of the John Birch Society. Very, very interesting. When we were in Wisconsin this past year during the uprising in Wisconsin, inspired by the Arab Spring and by the governor, Scott Walker, who after he was elected, set out to eviscerate the public unions, particularly the teachers and the nurses. And although he said he was not targeting the firefighters and the police, the firefighters and police said, if you're attacking them, you're attacking us. And they stood with the protesters. It was quite remarkable to see as they all slept in the Capitol, the People's House in Madison, 150,000 strong on the freezing cold days, they marched the largest protests in Wisconsin history. Scott Walker, who himself gets tremendous support from the Koch brothers, there was a blogger upstate New York, and when he heard that the Democratic legislators in Wisconsin had fled town, so that legislation would not be passed against um, the unions, uh, against the busting of the public unions. And the legislator said they couldn't reach Scott Walker. This father called up Walker and uh, tried to get through and said, oh, I'm, I think he said David Coke or Charles Coke, who was put right through. And it was this extended conversation which he recorded with the governor as this, state crisis was unfolding and the legislators, the democratically elected legislators said they weren't able to speak to the governor and he is um, pretending to be a co brother gets right through on the first call to his own shop. And then, then on the network he's vilified, as they said, and he calls himself a journalist and this blogger goes on TV and said, I never called himself a journalist. <laughs> and I said I was a co brother <laughs> Um, and by the way, this is not just a Republican problem. It's a Democratic problem as well. I think people of the cross, the political spectrum, are deeply concerned about the role money is playing in politics. But I wanted to go to talk to David Koch at the convention, on the convention floor, to ask him whether he thinks this concentration of wealth is subverting democracy, but it's really tough to do this. Last night, on the last night of the convention, I saw him sitting in a New York delegation. He was a New York delegate. And this had happened the day before as well. I go over, he's just off of the aisle, and as I come up, one by one, the delegates around him stand up, and then security comes over, and they form a human wall around him. The man sitting next to him stands up immediately, and I see his name is Ed Cox. Ed Cox is the, former, you know, the son-in-law of Richard Nixon, um, and he's the chair of the Republican Party of New York State. And I said, well, if you won't let me ask Mr. Koch, and I kept reaching over to try to ask Mr. Koch, but he was sort of um, just hungered down to a very tall man uh, behind all these men who were standing around him so that he wouldn't answer a simple question. But these conventions, the Democrats next week will be in Charlotte and the Republicans this week will be in Tampa, are supposed to be celebrations of democracy. And if you're proud of what you do, it's important to state what it is that you do. And that's how democracy will flourish. So I wasn't able to ask him that. I asked him the question, he didn't answer, and then I was pushed away. So as Mitt Romney was about to speak, I was on the other side of the convention in the New Hampshire delegation. That's when I looked up and saw the mystery speaker last night, <laughs> Eastwood. Who said conventions are boring? You know what was interesting is, you know, all of these conventions are so scripted. And when you're on the convention floor, you see the teleprompter at the back. It's huge. 
and they're just reading off the teleprompter. It's just funny, all of these politicians to know what they're gonna say before they even say it. They just would look back at the teleprompter and there were the words, and, and within seconds they would be saying those very words. I should have been broadcasting from the convention floor saying, I bet Senator Rubio will now say. <laughs> I look up and Clint Eastwood has an empty chair next to him. And he starts talking to, well, Obama. I mean, it was not suitable for family time, prime time. It was astonishing to see, and I'm sure that in the Mitt Romney suite, they were as shocked <laughs> as anyone to hear this conversation. This rambling, who was supposed to speak for three minutes, he spoke for something like 15, which meant that Mitt Romney, in the biggest night of his political life, was forced out of prime time. <laughs> President Obama said he would close Guantanamo, and he hasn't after a year. And who's speaking up on this platform? Do you think Mitt Romney was for the closing of Guantanamo? I mean, I think that President Obama should be faulted for not closing Guantanamo. But I didn't think that I would hear from the stage of the Republican convention that criticism. Or, as he said, continuing the war in Afghanistan. Now, I do think that President Obama should be fiercely criticized for continuing the longest war in the history of this country. But I do not think I would hear the person who was brought up, who uh, was brought up as the mystery guest that everyone was waiting for, criticizing President Obama for continuing this war and saying that Mitt Romney says he would pull troops out the next morning. Mitt Romney's jaw must have dropped when he heard this, right? The man would become his surrogate. Um, so there are always those remarkable moments, but it is so scripted, and they try to keep all of this under such wraps that when I saw Mitt Romney coming down the aisle, I turned to our videographer, John Hamilton, I said, I want you to film the Globetron that was showing him walking down and shaking hands with people. And John said, why? We're gonna get that from our, you know, from the networks, from Reuters that we use to uh, create our TV show that will show this. We'll get this later. I said, you know, I don't know what we'll get. So just start filming right now. Because as I saw him going down, I had spent a long time in that particular aisle. I had talked to Senator Orrin Hatch, the Utah delegation was right across from the New York delegation. I was talking to Senator Hatch about women's reproductive rights. And uh, he said that women don't care about that, they care about the economy. He asked his wife. Um, Hatch and Governor Walker said the same thing because the message they were walking in lockstep after the horrific embarrassment for them of Todd Aiken, the Republican senatorial candidate challenging Claire McCaskill in Missouri, who talked about legitimate rape, and that if a woman is legitimately raped, she would not become pregnant because her body shuts down. We have some special button that and so what that led to was that if you were to become pregnant, you were not legitimately raped. Um, this hor horrifying statement, and they, the Republicans, want to take over the Senate, and they know that Todd Aiken is a problem for them. So even Paul Ryan, the new vice presidential nominee, the um, now, it was presumptive until now, they have been nominated, called him to ask him to step down. I just got this fascinating email um, just now uh, from friends who sent a Bloomberg Business Week article exclusive inside Carl Rove's billionaire fundraiser. And it's by a person named Sheila Kohankar. Uh, 
And it says, on the final morning of the Republican National Convention, Karl Rove took to the stage of the Tampa Club to provide an exclusive breakfast briefing to about 70 of the Republican Party's highest earning and most powerful donors. During the more than hour-long session, Rove explained to an audience 